Chapter 44 Part 2 With Mahatma Gandhi Continued In it there is room for the worship of all the prophets of the world. It is not a missionary religion in the ordinary sense of the term. It has no doubt absorbed many tribes in its fold, but this absorption has been of an evolutionary, imperceptible character. Hinduism tells each man to worship God according to his own faith or dharma, and so lives at peace with all religions. Of Christ, Gandhi has written, I am sure that if he were living here now among men, he would bless the lives of many who perhaps have never even heard his name, just as it is written, Not every one that sighed unto me, Lord, Lord, but he that doeth the will of my Father. In the lesson of his own life, Jesus gave humanity the magnificent purpose and the single objective toward which we all ought to aspire. I believe that he belongs not solely to Christianity, but to the entire world, to all lands and races. On my last evening in Vardha, I addressed the meeting which had been called by Mr. Desai in town hall. The room was thronged to the window sills with about 400 people assembled to hear the talk on yoga. I spoke first in Hindi, then in English. Our little group returned to the ashram in time for a goodnight glimpse of Gandhi, enfolded in peace and correspondence. Night was still lingering when I rose at 5 a.m. Village life was already stirring, first a bullock cart by the ashram gates, then a peasant with his huge burden balanced precariously on his head. After breakfast our trio sought out Gandhi for farewell pronouns. The saint rises at four o'clock for his morning prayer. Mahatmaji, goodbye. I knelt to touch his feet. India is safe in your keeping. Years have rolled by since the Vardha idol. The earth, oceans, and skies have darkened with a world at war. Alone among great leaders, Gandhi has offered a practical non-violent alternative to armed might. To redress grievances and remove injustices, the Mahatma has employed non-violent means which again and again have proved their effectiveness. He states his doctrine in these words, I have found that life persists in the midst of destruction. Therefore there must be a higher law than that of destruction. Only under that law would well-ordered society be intelligible and life worth living. If that is the law of life we must work it out in daily existence. Wherever there are wars, wherever we are confronted with an opponent, conquer by love. I have found that the certain law of love has answered in my own life as the law of destruction has never done. In India we have had an ocular demonstration of the operation of this law on the widest scale possible. I don't claim that non-violence has penetrated the 360 million people in India, but I do claim it has penetrated deeper than any other doctrine in an incredibly short time. It takes a fairly strenuous course of training to attain a mental state of non-violence. It is a disciplined life, like the life of a soldier. The perfect state is reached only when the mind, body, and speech are in proper coordination. Every problem would lend itself to solution if we determined to make the law of truth and non-violence the law of life. Just as a scientist will work wonders out of various applications of the laws of nature, a man who applies the laws of love with scientific precision can work greater wonders. Non-violence is infinitely more wonderful and subtle than forces of nature like, for instance, electricity. The law of love is a far greater science than any modern science. Consulting history, one may reasonably state that the problems of mankind have not been solved by the use of brute force. 
World War I produced a world-chilling snowball of war karma that swelled into World War II. Only the warmth of brotherhood can melt the present colossal snowball of war karma, which may otherwise grow into World War III. This unholy trinity will banish forever the possibility of World War IV by a finality of atomic bombs. Use of jungle logic instead of human reason in settling disputes will restore the earth to a jungle. If brothers not in life, then brothers in violent death. War and crime never pay. The billions of dollars that went up in the smoke of explosive nothingness would have been sufficient to have made a new world, one almost free from disease and completely free from poverty. Not an earth of fear, chaos, famine, pestilence, the dance macabre, but one broad land of peace, of prosperity, and of widening knowledge. The non-violent voice of Gandhi appeals to man's highest conscience. Let nations ally themselves no longer with death, but with life, not with destruction, but with construction, not with the annihilator, but with the creator. One should forgive, under any injury, says the Mahabharata. It hath been said that the continuation of species is due to man's being forgiving. Forgiveness is holiness, by forgiveness the universe is held together. Forgiveness is the might of the mighty, forgiveness is sacrifice, forgiveness is quiet of mind. Forgiveness and gentleness are the qualities of the self-possessed. They represent eternal virtue. Non-violence is the natural outgrowth of the law of forgiveness and love. If loss of life becomes necessary in a righteous battle, Gandhi proclaims, one should be prepared, like Jesus, to shed his own, not others, blood. Eventually there will be less blood spilt in the world. Epics shall someday be written on the Indian Satyagrahis who withstood hate with love, violence with non-violence, who allowed themselves to be mercilessly slaughtered rather than retaliate. The result on certain historic occasion was that the armed opponents threw down their guns and fled, shamed, shaken to their depths by the sight of men who valued the life of another above their own. I would wait, if need be for ages, Gandhi says, rather than seek the freedom of my country through bloody means. Never does the Mahatma forget the majestic warning. All they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Gandhi has written, I call myself a nationalist, but my nationalism is as broad as the universe. It includes in its sweep all the nations of the earth. My nationalism includes the well-being of the whole world. I do not want my India to rise on the ashes of other nations. I do not want India to exploit a single human being. With a single nation in Europe today, they do not give strength to the others. President Wilson mentioned his beautiful 14 points, but said, After all, if this endeavor of ours to arrive at peace fails, we have our armaments to fall back upon. I want to reverse that position, and I say, our armaments have failed already. Let us now be in search of something new. Let us try the force of love and God which is truth. When we have got that, we shall want nothing else. By the Mahatma's training of thousands of true Satyagrahis, those who have taken the eleven rigorous woes mentioned in the first part of this chapter, who in turn spread the message, by patiently educating the Indian masses to understand the spiritual and eventually material benefits of non-violence, by arming his people with non-violent weapons non-cooperation with injustice, the willingness to endure indignities, prison, death itself rather than resort to arms, by enlisting world sympathy. Through countless examples of heroic martyrdom among Satyagrahis, Gandhi has dramatically portrayed the practical nature of non-violence, 
its solemn power to settle disputes without war. Gandhi has already won through non-violent means a greater number of political concessions for his land than have ever been won by any leader of any country except through bullets. Non-violent methods for eradication of all wrongs and evils have been strikingly applied not only in the political arena but in the delicate and complicated field of Indian social reform. Gandhi and his followers have removed many long-standing feuds between Hindus and Mohammedans. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims look to the Mahatma as their leader. The untouchables have found in him their fearless and triumphant champion. If there be a rebirth in store for me, Gandhi wrote, I wish to be born a pariah in the midst of pariahs, because thereby I would be able to render them more effective service. The Mahatma is indeed a great soul, but it was illiterate millions who had the discernment to bestow the title. This gentle prophet is honoured in his own land. The lowly peasant has been able to rise to Gandhi's high challenge. The Mahatma wholeheartedly believes in the inherent nobility of man. The inevitable failures have never disillusioned him. Even if the opponent plays him false twenty times, he writes, the Satyagrahi is ready to trust him the twenty-first time, for an implicit trust in human nature is the very essence of the creed. Mahatmaji, you are an exceptional man. You must not expect the world to act as you do. A critic once made this observation. It is curious how we delude ourselves, fancying that the body can be improved, but that it is impossible to evoke the hidden powers of the soul, Gandhi replied. I am engaged in trying to show that if I have any of those powers, I am as frail a mortal as any of us, and that I never had anything extraordinary about me nor have I now. I am a simple individual liable to a like any other fellow mortal. I own, however, that I have enough humility to confess my errors and to retrace my steps. I own that I have an immovable faith in God and His goodness, and in www.holybooks.com unconsumable passion for truth and love. But is that not what every person has latent in him? If we are to make progress, we must not repeat history but make new history. We must add to the inheritance left by our ancestors. If we may make new discoveries and inventions in the phenomenal world, must we declare our bankruptcy in the spiritual domain? Is it impossible to multiply the exceptions so as to make them the rule? Must man always be brute first and man after, if at all? Americans may well remember with pride the successful non-violent experiment of William Penn in founding his 17th century colony in Pennsylvania. There were no forts, no soldiers, no militia, even no arms. Amidst the savage frontier wars and the butcheries that went on between the new settlers and the Red Indians, the Quakers of Pennsylvania alone remained unmolested. Others were slain, others were massacred, but they were safe. Not a Quaker woman suffered assault, not a Quaker child was slain, not a Quaker man was tortured. When the Quakers were finally forced to give up the government of the state, war broke out and some Pennsylvanians were killed. But only three Quakers were killed three who had so far fallen from their faith as to carry weapons of defence. Resort to force in the Great War, I, fail to bring tranquillity, Franklin D. Roosevelt has pointed out. Victory and defeat were alike sterile. That lesson the world should have learned. The more weapons of violence, the more misery to mankind, Lao Tzu taught. The triumph of violence ends in a festival of mourning. I am fighting for nothing less than world peace, Gandhi has declared. 
if the indian movement is carried to success on a non-violent satyagraha basis it will give a new meaning to patriotism and if i may say so in all humility to life itself before the west dismisses gandhi's program as one of an impractical dreamer let it first reflect on a definition of satyagraha by the master of galilee ye have heard that it hath been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but i say unto you that ye resist not evil but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek turn to him the other also gandhi's epoch has extended with the beautiful precision of cosmic timing into a century already desolated and devastated by two world wars a divine handwriting appears on the granite wall of his life a warning against the further shedding of blood among brothers mahatma gandhi visited my high school with yoga training at ranchi he graciously wrote the above lines in the ranchi guest book the translation is this institution has deeply impressed my mind i cherish high hopes that this school will encourage the further practical use of the spinning wheel signed mohandas gandhi 17 september 1925 i want india to be strong in order that she can infect the other nations also with her strength not so with a single nation in europe today they do not give strength to the others president wilson mentioned his beautiful 14 points but said after all if this endeavor of ours to arrive at peace fails we have our armaments to fall back upon i want to reverse that position and i say our armaments have failed already let us now be in search of something new let us try the force of love and god which is truth when we have got that we shall want nothing else by the mahatma's training of thousands of true satyagrahis those who have taken the 11 rigorous vows mentioned in the first part of this chapter who in turn spread the message by patiently educating the indian masses to understand the spiritual and eventually material benefits of non-violence by arming his people with non-violent weapons non cooperation with injustice the willingness to endure indignities prison death itself rather than resort to arms by enlisting world sympathy through countless examples of heroic martyrdom among satyagrahis gandhi has dramatically portrayed the practical nature of non-violence its solemn power to settle disputes without war gandhi has already won through non-violent means a greater number of political concessions for his land than have ever been won by any leader of any country except through bullets Non-violent methods for eradication of all wrongs and evils have been strikingly applied not only in the political arena but in the delicate and complicated field of Indian social reform. Gandhi and his followers have removed many long-standing feuds between Hindus and Mohammedans. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims look to the Mahatma as their leader. the untouchables have found in him their fearless and triumphant champion if there be a rebirth in store for me gandhi wrote i wish to be born a paria in the midst of parias because thereby i would be able to render them more effective service the mahatma is indeed a great soul but it was illiterate millions who had the discernment to bestow the title This gentle prophet is honored in his own land. The lowly peasant has been able to rise to Gandhi's high challenge. The Mahatma wholeheartedly believes in the inherent nobility of man. The inevitable failures have never disillusioned him. Even if the opponent plays him false twenty times, he writes, the satyagrahi is ready to trust him the twenty-first time. for an implicit trust in human nature is the very essence of the creed mahatma ji you are an exceptional man you must not expect the world to act as you do
A critic once made this observation. It is curious how we delude ourselves, fancying that the body can be improved, but that it is impossible to evoke the hidden powers of the soul, Gandhi replied. I am engaged in trying to show that if I have any of those powers, I am as frail a mortal as any of us, and that I never had anything extraordinary about me nor have I now. I am a simple individual liable to a like any other fellow mortal. I own, however, that I have enough humility to confess my errors and to retrace my steps. I own that I have an immovable faith in God and His goodness and an unconsumable passion for truth and love. But is that not what every person has latent in him? If we are to make progress, we must not repeat history but make new history. We must add to the inheritance left by our ancestors. If we may make new discoveries and inventions in the phenomenal world, must we declare our bankruptcy in the spiritual domain? Is it impossible to multiply the exceptions so as to make them the rule? Must man always be brute first and man after, if at all? Americans may well remember with pride the successful non-violent experiment of William Penn in founding his 17th century colony in Pennsylvania. There were no forts, no soldiers, no militia, even no arms. Amidst the savage frontier wars and the butcheries that went on between the new settlers and the Red Indians, the Quakers of Pennsylvania alone remained unmolested. Others were slain, others were massacred, but they were safe. Not a Quaker woman suffered assault, not a Quaker child was slain, not a Quaker man was tortured. When the Quakers were finally forced to give up the government of the state, war broke out and some Pennsylvanians were killed. But only three Quakers were killed three who had so far fallen from their faith as to carry weapons of defence. Resort to force in the Great War, I, fail to bring tranquility, Franklin D. Roosevelt has pointed out. Victory and defeat were alike sterile. That lesson the world should have learned. The more weapons of violence, the more misery to mankind, Lao Tzu taught. The triumph of violence ends in a festival of mourning. I am fighting for nothing less than world peace, Gandhi has declared. If the Indian movement is carried to success on a non-violent satyagraha basis, it will give a new meaning to patriotism and, if I may say so in all humility, to life itself. Before the West dismisses Gandhi's program as one of an impractical dreamer, let it first reflect on a definition of Satyagraha by the Master of Galilee. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Gandhi's epoch has extended, with the beautiful precision of cosmic timing, into a century already desolated and devastated by two world wars. A divine handwriting appears on the granite wall of his life, a warning against the further shading of blood among brothers. Mahatma Gandhi visited my high school with yoga training at Ranchi. He graciously wrote the above lines in the Ranchi guest book. The translation is this institution has deeply impressed my mind. I cherish high hopes that this school will encourage the further practical use of the spinning wheel. Signed, Mohandas Gandhi, 17 September 1925. This marks the end of Chapter 44. Thank you for liking and following the channel.